great. Well, it's our joy to continue studying uh, in, in the Word and continuing in our Philippian series. And uh, I think one of the more, I don't know, I probably get old saying that. I think every passage is one of the most remarkable passages, although the one after this is really good too. So uh, it's, it's okay, I think, to have lots of favorites when it comes to God's Word. And, and I think such a pressing issue for us to look at what how, how do you find a life worth living? What do we live for? For so many people, they end up saying, you know what, we're going to live for money. And you say, well, Someone would say, no, not, not for money, just all that money will buy. And, and then, of course, that ends up being the same thing, doesn't it? And uh, some would just live for <clears throat> that, that next thing, the next toy, the next trip, the next uh, promotion. And, uh, and, and others realize, oh, no, that's not, that's not it at all. And for some, they, they end up settling for so little and then sliding into despair uh, through this time, even with isolation, uh, becoming so difficult. Uh, suicide hotlines have, have never been busier. Uh, mental health is a major concern. I know some, you were talking about the nursing homes, some inside there feeling that, that more will die from heartache and isolation than, than from COVID. And, uh, and for, for some, they just, uh, in fact, are, uh, our OB doctor, uh, one appointment, we, we walked in and, and, and her mother had just died that morning and she said, I, I believe she died of a broken heart and, and, uh, and I know she's not alone and so many and for some to just end up settling for so little in life and the enemy of our soul will lie to us and say, if you take this, if you grab this, this will meet all your needs and this will fill the hole in your soul, but it never does. And, and then people sliding into despair. For some, they kind of trudge from one milestone to the next. You think, you know, it's all about the next thing. So they think, okay, marriage, that will be it, and, and that will make me happy, and then they get married, and then they think, oh, that, that didn't do it, so then we're going to have, have children, even good things, good things to, to, to fill your life with, and, and then, you know, the next transition, okay, that will be it. It will all be better when, and going from one milestone to the next milestone. Strange reality, but as we study even divorce, you can see huge spikes in divorce around the milestones and trying to figure out why is that. And, and part of the reason I, they think is because people are living for the next milestone and then when it doesn't deliver what it was supposed to deliver, then there's just disappointment and despondency and people turning in frustration and blaming others for the lack of meaning in their life. So what's the answer? Some just say, you know what, that's all so hard. And they medicate. They could medicate literally. And they can medicate in other ways with food or with relationships. And just saying this, this reality is hard. And so then it's too hard to be dealt with. And so they medicate. But this pressing issue of just saying in journey's end, when you come to the end of your life, is there something worth all of it? Is there a way that you could look back on your life and not have regret and sadness, not feeling like you did it all in vain? Is there something worth it all? And that's the very question that the Apostle Paul is writing on. I think the, the words he has for us just ring down through the centuries and couldn't be more relevant for us today. So let's just quiet our hearts as we prepare for God to work in us and commit the balance of our time to him in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we invite you in, Lord. We know that uh, we need you. Lord, we ask that the Spirit would be alive and active in our hearts. Lord, would you help us to set aside any pressing distractions that might be pressing upon us? Lord, would you, would you open up our eyes and our ears so that we might see and that we might hear all that you want to show us and all that you want to say to us? Lord, we know that we desperately need you, and we desperately need your word. And so we commit this time to you, asking, even begging, for you to work in our midst and for your word to come back, accomplishing all that you would intend for it to do in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's come uh, to God. I think a lot of times when we approach God's word with desperation and we're saying, I need what God has for us, uh, then the word of God will penetrate into your heart much deeper. If you're curious or kicking the tires or, or just interested in what might God have to say, it's not going to penetrate into your heart nearly as deeply as when you approach him and his word with desperation. 
Here's what uh, God's Word has to say this morning. So Philippians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up. Uh, if you're reading from a pew Bible, those are, North, those are New American Standard. Very similar, a couple of differences from the English Standard that I'll read from this morning. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and have share of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Such a powerful passage. Here's the big idea for the whole series, that we might grow in our passion, in our purpose, and in our progress as full partners in the progress and the advance of the gospel. My hope and prayer is that by the end of this series, if God were to look at any one of our hearts he would see that we've grown, that we've grown, that we've made progress as partners in advancing the gospel. And for this sermon, here's the big idea. By abandoning all other pursuits, we can live a life of singular focus on Christ, being transformed in his image and receiving the gifts God gives in his name. So let's, uh, let's go through this passage. There's so much here. We're going to go through it carefully. And then we'll look at how we can apply it. I'm going to take a step back before I take a step forward. Don't always do this. Uh, but uh, when I originally mapped out the series, I kind of flirted with the idea of taking 1 through 11 uh, because it is one singular thought driving through the whole thing. But uh, there's a lot there in 11 verses, and uh, I just felt like we, we couldn't do justice to the whole thing, so split it. But... Uh, just to, to kind of build some momentum back, here's some of the big ideas from last week. If you weren't here, or even if you were, a lot of life happens in any given week. Uh, that we need to keep coming back to joy. That he's saying, it's not a problem for me to repeat these things. It's good for you. It's good for us to keep coming back to joy. That God repeats things for us because it's for our good. And if you're tired of what God's repeating to you, I encourage you to get over that, because the reason God's uh, repeating the things that keep getting repeated for us is because we need it. If we didn't need it, he wouldn't keep saying it. Uh, at times we love novelty uh, more than we should, that we need to be aware of people who lie to us and tell us that we can do things we can't do. The enemy of our soul invites us to try to earn what we can't earn, so, and, and it's, uh, it's an unwinnable game. We can't rely on our abilities to earn right standing. And it's that, that last theme that Paul is building on in this passage. So, uh, do you remember the game of life? I don't know if you ever played that. We did. Uh, you know, having recently had a child, I noticed in the game it was a lot easier to have a baby. It was like you just stuck the, the blue peg in your car and you move on. It's just a lot simpler. And uh, that, that'd be nice if it was that, that easy. And Paul is saying, if anyone can win this earning it game, Paul can and this might sound arrogant, but I think Paul's maybe the, the Michael Jordan of legalists in his day. You know, I mean, he's just saying, I, I think that I, I, you know, you're not going to do anything that I didn't do. It sounds weird and arrogant. I mean, can't let you think of it this way. Paul's talking to this church, but in a way, there's a triangle here. There's another opponent in the room, and Paul's going to be talking to them in a way and talking to the church in a way so some of what Paul's doing here is addressing his comments to a set of people that uh, he calls in the passage we just looked at, ravenous dogs who go from town to town ripping people apart. So he, he uh, has some things to say to them, 
And if, it was, if they weren't in the room, if they weren't in the conversation, Paul would be approaching this differently. But they are in the room, and they are in the conversation. So Paul says this, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. <laughs> this is like Paul's throwing down the gauntlet. You think you can earn it? You're like, I, I, can, I can do it more. I can do it better. And on top of that, I'm like way more humble than you. I can, I can like, my humility will beat your humility into the pulp. I'm so humble. You know, it's like, mm, you know, there's a bit of irony here, isn't there? I mean, you know, but he's just saying, you're going to try and earn it, really? You know, what, do you, what are you going to do that I have not done? What are you going to try? I've been there. I've done that. If you even thought of it, I've already tried it. Okay? And you're like, gosh, that sounds arrogant, but you have to understand who, who this guy is. It, to really get an understanding of this verse, you'd have to do a deep plunge on the biography of Paul and what it is to be a Pharisee. I, I didn't fully get this till I had a chance to be uh, in Israel. And they, they talked about a test. I don't know for sure that Paul did it. I think probably he did, but it's kind of like the, the ultimate test where they would put a knife through the, the scriptures and they'd memorized, <laughs> memorized the Old Testament and, and touch, talk, give every word that the knife would touch as it goes through. Uh, you know, you're talking about an insane level of memorization uh, where words are on the page and uh, what word that must have touched uh, all the way through. You're, you're talking about a crazy level of obsession with, by, by 13, anyone who's being groomed to be in the Pharisaical tradition would have the Torah memorized. Uh, and, uh, and so you're, you're talking about a commitment to uh, the scriptures that, that we do not know and do not understand and haven't seen anything like it. So he kind of walks through it. So Paul's like, you want to see? He's trying to do this, though, for a purpose. He's trying to show all that would walk in his footsteps and make the same mistake he did, uh, that, that, that it's a completely fruitless path. It's like Paul's on a road, and, and he knows that the bridge is out. And he knows because he drove over the bridge. And he put the car into a, into a concrete bankment and dragged his bloody carcass out. And, and now he's on the bridge saying, the bridge is out. It doesn't work. You can't do that. Maybe you know someone like that. If you've done that in life, if you've learned the hard way, you know, I say God sometimes uses the two by four to teach us things. And if you've been whacked by God with the two by four and he broke it over your head, one of the things that can happen is you're passionate about helping others not learn in such a hard way. Paul sitting here on this saying the bridge is out, it doesn't work, waving his hands is not arrogance. It's a desperate form of love that would keep you from making the same mistake. If you're a parent and you've made some mistakes and you want your kids to avoid that, then you know what I'm talking about. It's not arrogance. It's just that I've been there and I've done that, and you don't need to experience the pain I have in order to learn what I've learned. That's what Paul's talking about. So what is he he's saying? Well, he's kind of got his legalistic resume. I don't think Paul wanted to do this. It's kind of like, you made me do it. <laughs> he, these opponents kind of brought him to it. So he's pouring everything in his life into right earning, right standing with God, trying to have meticulous obedience to the law. And we know a lot about Pharisees and uh, because there's a lot of literature that survived to this day. There's two Hebrew works, the Mishnah and the Talmud, and uh, they, are, they are extant today. You can read them today, and uh, they have a long rabbinic tradition talking about what this all is about. So Paul's like, okay, so you want to, here's my resume. You, wanna, you think you're going to win this game? You're going to win the, here, I'll give you my resume. So we kind of walk through it. <clears throat> bit by bit, circumcised on the eighth day. Again, to us, circumcision plays a different role. You either do it or you don't do it. Most, uh, most don't do it this way. Uh, even if circumcision happens, they prefer to have a doctor do it in a surgical suite rather than uh, you know, a rabbi with a flint knife. Right. So even when circumcision is happening in our context, it's not done the same way, but it, this is how it was done. This is according to the law. Jesus was circumcised in the same way uh, on the same day. 
He's like, you want to know about pedigree? You want to know about lineage? Okay. I'm people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. I got the right pedigree. I got the right lineage. And if that matters to you, you're, you're not going to outdo me coming from the right family. Uh, if you want to talk about meticulous obedience to the law, as to the law, a Pharisee. It, a Pharisee is like a legalist's legalist. Like right? when, when you're a legalist and you want to try to earn right standing with God through obeying everything, this, uh, then, then you'd, you'd want to go to like Pharisee camp, you know, and, and you'd want to, to go and to grow. They, they like, they say you need to tithe. What's tithing? Giving a tenth. Like of what? They're like, of everything. You're like, really? Like everything? Yes, everything. Go into your house, go into your spice cupboard, figure out how much dill you have in that little jar. Okay, weigh it out. And put it on a little scale and then carve out and give it, if you have, if you have a, a two ounces, God gets two tenths of an ounce of dill. And, uh, and so just kind of scoot over that and then put over, okay, this is God's dill now. Okay, now on to pepper. Now you're going to take how much pepper do you got, weigh it out, and then you, God, gets, God gets his cut of pepper. And you're like, you know, how many spices you got? This could take a while. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, like, what do you got? You know, if I were to, you got some diesel, all right, 10%. Siphon it out if you have to. If you swallow some, that's okay. God gets 10% of your diesel. He gets 10% of everything. And uh, it's like, really? Like, literally everything? Like, not like you couldn't just give God 10% of your income. No, no, no. 10% of everything. And find out, you know, and that's, that's just one corner. It's like, well, you can't work on the Sabbath. Well, what would be working? <laughs> well, there's a whole rabbinic line about what would be working. You know, it, when I was in Israel, there's like, uh, there's elevators and they have them set up so that on, on, on Sabbath, on, that, that the, the elevator stops on every floor. And it wasn't because the kid went, nin, 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 nin. have you ever had that happen? That's annoying, you know. Especially if you're in like Mayo, you know, there's 19 and you're like, you're like, oh, we're stopping at every floor. Awesome. Okay. They have the elevator set up so it stops on every floor on Sabbath always. That's to avoid the act of pushing the button because somebody's determined that would be work. Like, eh, you just worked. Okay. So, you know, you're like, I know there's some that would leave the TV on if they want to watch TV on the Sabbath because... Clicker, you just worked, all right? So some rabbi somewhere has kind of figured out that, eh, that's work. You just violated the Sabbath. Is it in the law? No, because the law doesn't know about elevators or TVs. But it's, it's in meticulous obedience to the law. I mean, to the level where we think that's just crazy. You're like, we haven't even gotten started yet. We are going to obey so meticulously, so ridiculous that it's just, it's just crazy, Jesus actually comes to confront this as the zeal persecutor of the church. When Stephen is killed, it says that heaven is opened up. It's in, the, it's in the text. Did you catch it? Paul is running, Saul, later to be called Paul, is running the coat check on Stephen's execution. He's like saying, you want to kill this guy? As in, let's throw rocks at his head till he bleeds out. That's cool. I think it's a good idea. I'll hold your coat so it doesn't get dusty. And that was only the beginning. He, he killed Christians on purpose. He tortured them so that they would deny Christ. He whipped people. He threw them in jail. He killed them. Like, how are you going to out more zeal that? If you want a zealous fanatic... You're like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like, how? There's whatever you can think of. Yeah, I also did that too. You're not going to be more fanatical. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Blameless obedience. Oh, blameless obedience to the law. And what, in the end? Checkmate. It's worthless. And that's what he ends up saying. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Now this, I think, is Paul reflecting on the day when he's riding to Damascus and the Lord Jesus appears to him 
and his whole life shifted. Everything he lived for, everything he was moving towards, he found out that he was going the wrong way. It's like beyond hitting rock bottom. This was such a shocking revelation. He didn't eat or drink or do anything for three days. And he was waiting to be healed. He was waiting to be restored. He's like his whole life, he realized, I've been running down this road and it was leading me to nothing. He was the most advanced among those in his age. And he said it's all a waste, all for nothing. I, I was looking at, so I like how some of the churches talk about this group of churches. We're talking about a certain thing. They said we got to the top of the ladder and we found out the ladder, our ladder's against the wrong wall. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, what do you do then? You're like, no, no, this is the right wall. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be here. No, you have to get back down. That's Paul. He's, he got to the top of the ladder. There's nowhere else to go. And he realizes I'm against the wrong wall. This was all for waste. This is all for naught. It's a horrible feeling. Paul would save you from that. So what is this ultimate purpose in life then? What would Paul give us instead? He says, indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And he counted this all as loss and rubbish. You guess from the picture that rubbish may not be the best translation. I think I can safely say this is the first time I've ever put horse poop on a slide. Uh, you know, I don't think, uh, I was kind of funny, you know, look at some of these, I go for non-copyrighted pictures because I'm cheap and I want to pay for them. And like some people are like really jealously guarding their horse picture poop. Uh, you know, it's like, really? This is like a national treasure? I think we can, we can probably just take a picture of that. You don't need to guard it. Uh, but, but finding the ultimate life purpose with no regret, can you imagine that? No regret requires that we abandon our flawed human systems of valuation. Our whole economy is built on valuation systems. What is the value of something? And we make trades all the time. When you give currency up for something, you're deciding that that's worth this, okay? But we have to come to a point, we have to admit that we value in God's eyes what is worthless. And we throw away as worthless what he considers precious. This is, this, is the, this is the root problem. This is how we end up wasting our lives. Because we can end up pouring everything into what Paul's going to call manure and, and uh, end up wasting our lives. And he doesn't want you to do that. But we have to get our head around this. So what does this look like? What is worth more? Character or gold? Okay? What's worth more? Money or, or your integrity? Well, people trade their character for money every day, don't they? When you compromise morally with your integrity and you when you shave the corners to get a business deal, you've said what your integrity is worth. You've sold it. For Judas, his soul was worth 30 pieces of silver. He, he, that's what it was worth. And then he ended up flinging that into the temple. He didn't even want it. But, but he was weighed and measured, and he was worth 30 pieces of silver. For other people, uh, their integrity, their character is worth a business deal. And they'll sell it, and they do every day. For others, maybe it's not one big thing, one lump sum payment. It's not that dramatic. Maybe for some, it's just installments. They'll sell their soul. It makes you think of uh, Jesus saying, what does it profit a man if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Uh, in a classic work, Dr. Faust sold his soul to the devil for a sum. And some of you find that shocking. But then others would continue to do the same thing, just without maybe all the flair of the deal. God's economy is completely the opposite. In God's economy, gold is worth much less than character. And First Peter says, so the testing of the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes. And just think about this in terms of the atonement. Jesus decided that your life was worth his blood. That we, in the end of the day, 
we have a sin problem and, and money wasn't going to solve it. God has infinite resources. He, can, he couldn't just write a check. He couldn't just give us a sum of money. He gave us what was infinitely more than that, worth more than that, and that is, and that is uh, character in his blood. It reminds me, I saw this one cartoon a while back where it had these two thieves that broke into heaven. Of course, you know, how does that happen? Like, God's sovereignty doesn't run out, but it, it was just for fun. So these two thieves break in to heaven, and they're all wowed and whatever, and then they see the streets of gold. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. So they got out a jackhammer, and they're digging up uh, the streets of gold and throwing it in a wheelbarrow, and it has one angel looking at another angel, and like, what are they doing? And the other's like, I think they're stealing asphalt. And, uh, and it was just so strange, right? I mean, can you imagine that? Like right out here, someone's like sneaking out there and they got a jackhammer and, and you're like, what are you doing? I'm stealing blacktop. You know, like, are you insane? Like no one steals asphalt, you know? It, it's not worth that much, you know? If you really want to, go and buy them, you know, like put, put some asphalt down for you. It's really not that impressive. You don't have to sneak out with your jackhammer and steal it. And that's how absurd it is in the economy of God. Like you have all these riches, you have all this stuff, you're gonna come here and try and steal some gold? Like why would you even think that way? It's absurd in the economy of God. But the reason it's not absurd is because we're approaching this from a completely different value system. They would say, oh, you know what? If you put gold on one side of the balance and, and character on another, a lot of people say, oh, I'll, I'll sell my character for gold. Do it every time. It's because we don't get it. So indeed, he says, I count everything as loss so that I might know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This word knowing is really, uh, really important. So uh, maybe just, if you have your Bibles, just circle that knowing. I think in the West, we have kind of missed biblical Christianity on this. We think of knowing as a primarily cognitive exercise. It's a matter of intellectual apprehension. Like, I understand this idea. This word is typical in terms of the New Testament. This word means to know something through experience. Like, when you say, I know someone... And what do you mean? Like, we've lived life for 20 years. I know who they are. I've seen who they are when all the chips are down. That's the knowing involved here. It's not, I've learned facts about that person. You know, you can have groupies that know a lot about someone that don't know them, never met them. They could, they could recite information, but they don't know them. Uh, it reminds me of a story I heard about this, uh, I think it's a true story, uh, that this family was made aware that they had a rich uncle that died and, and uh, left a vast fortune, millions of dollars to them, and they had to go and claim it. And so they went uh, to Virginia, and they had dug out this chest, and, uh, and they were expecting this massive fortune, and it was filled with $2 million of Confederate currency. And, uh, and they went, oh, okay, so that's, what is that worth today? That's toilet paper, which today, maybe, is up in the market, but uh, for them, uh, for them, it was like, oh, this is worthless. This is just worthless. We thought we had this treasure. You know, they came down there anticipating millions of dollars. Back then, millions would be like billions today. And, uh, and then they find out that it's worthless. It's Confederate currency and the government had collapsed already. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. This is like the worst mistake you can make in your life that that you would go running headlong down and want to think you're just arms are full of riches and then in the end of the day you find out they're all worthless. Paul doesn't want you to make that mistake. And he says this life of purpose is found. He says for Jesus, for him, I have suffered the loss of all things. Or he counted worthless things as worthless. So here's why the slide. I think this word rubbish you know, sometimes Bible translators don't like to use graphic words when they translate the Bible because they feel like it'd be maybe less spiritual. Um, so there's some times when they soft pedal it a little bit. This word is kind of where manure meets mud. Okay, uh, my wife and I uh, have horses and we'll do large bales and, and uh, they just plow through that hay so fast. Uh, one in particular horse just goes nuts with it. So we got one of those nets to kind of slow them down. And this was like a lot of rain. And uh, I remember just it, that net got just buried, uh, you know, and we're like, we, 
we like to think of it as mud. It's good for morale, you know? I mean, you just say, can we just agree? Let's call this mud. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's sort of manure mud or maybe a little bit of muddy manure. I don't, I don't know what the relative composition is. You know, we're trying to pull that thing out of there, and that's, that's the word. You know, if you came along and said, you know, Pastor Kevin, you, you got some nice muddy manure there. Uh, I'd like to make an offer. You know, would you, would you pay, uh, would you like to get a million dollars? I would take you up on that. I would, I would sell my muddy manure or manure mud, whichever it is, for a million dollars. Deal. I'll take it. No one's offering. No one ever came by with that offer. That's the word. He's saying, I've counted all of this my whole life. Everything that I poured into it, I counted that as a big pile of muddy manure. And that's no way to live. That's regret. When you come to the end of it and say, that's what my life is. That's what I traded everything. I traded my soul for a pile of muddy manure. And he doesn't want you to do that. He says everything in this life is worthless relative to knowing Christ, knowing him by experience, walking with him and having life with him and in him. Being in Christ is worth all the sacrifices that you would give. And that's what Paul is trying to, to drive us towards. That's what he's trying to give us. So he says that I might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him again in experience and know the power of his resurrection and share with him in his suffering. And so that leads us to hard realities that we want to say, I want Christ. I want to be with him. I want to be in him. And here's the deal as a Christian. If you are going to follow Christ, he's going to give you everything. That means you're going to get what he got, but you're going to, you're going to receive all the blessings that he has. And some of that is wonderful, and some of it is hard. Because we're going to have to know what his suffering looks like. Becoming like him in his suffering means that if we're going to, Jesus said it this way, that a servant is not above his master. If they did this to the master, what do you think they're going to do to you? That you need to expect that this road of becoming like Jesus won't always be easy. Paul, who is writing this, is in jail. All that I might know Christ. Part of knowing Christ is being willing to suffer with him. It's being willing to endure hardships with with him as he's with you and in you. And then you know in these hard times that he is present. Sharing in his sufferings is a deeper level of identifying with Christ. Becoming like him even in his death. Now I know that's hard, right? Because you're like, ah, how did he die again? You're like, that's right, that's right. He was crucified and he was flogged because he loved us. And saying that I would in any way need to walk a road that he walked is a, is a hard reality to swallow. But the, the point he's driving to, though, is that by any means possible, I might obtain his resurrected life. That's the message of the New Testament. That when you are with Jesus, you get everything he got. That means you're going to walk with him in difficulty, but you are going to be resurrected just like he was. And that his life and his glory and his light and everything Jesus got, you will get also. So let's linger and look at how we might apply God's life-giving truth. I think, first of all, we have to admit that we would never be able to earn right standing with God. You know, you're always told to be used never very, you know, like never say never. Be very judicious. <laughs> I feel really good about saying never here. Never. Not like, oh, it might have gone the other way. No, I wouldn't have. And, and that's what Paul's saying. Like, I, he said, I tried it all. You, you want, like, what are you going to think of? Like, I was so zealous for my cause, I killed people. I tortured them. Right? You're not going to do more than that. I, I tithe down to my salt and pepper. I, I, I memorized God's word. I, I fasted for weeks. I, I denied myself all kinds of things. And you, you're not going to... You're not going to do anything that he didn't do. And he said, all of it is like, I was never going to earn right standing with God. It was never going to work. This is so crucial because there's some today, and it happens all the time, they think, I'm a pretty good guy. You know, you're like, we're going to grade on a curve. Right? So there's like Gandhi and, and Hitler. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's on a curve. Pretty, I'm a pretty good guy. 
You know, and so that, that's, that's not it at all. Paul's a really good guy in that sense. And he is never going to get there. We have to admit that my trying to earn God's affection, earn his approval, was never going to work. I think we have to abandon the world's system of valuation, admit that we chase after worthless things, and cast aside and ignore priceless things. I tell you, if we could live our life now in light of eternity, I get to spend time with people as they are ushered into God's presence. I tell you, I, I've never heard someone say, oh, gosh, I wish I just worked more. You know, I wish I would have spent more time on the spreadsheets. You know, I wish I would have gotten more equipment. I wish I would have gotten, I've never heard someone say that. And if you could look at your life in light of eternity and what, what is worth it and what is worthless, Paul's trying to save you from heartache to look at your life and say, I've piled up an enormous pile of muddy manure. And what did I give up for it? Everything. You got took. Someone sold you the book Brooklyn Bridge big time. And, and Paul would save you from that heartache. So we need to ask God for help. I think we can practice generosity. Generosity helps right our systems, right? When you invest in kingdom stuff, then, then you know that that, uh, that you're going to make a difference. You can choose the value, God's value system by saying, you know what, character matters more than gold. Consider everything other than Christ in the end a big pile of manure. I know that's like really countercultural and probably would take a lot for us to do that. We need to align our life choices. If we think that's true, then we need to act like it, right? If Christ is our ultimate prize, then we need to act like it. And our choices need to reflect that. If union with Christ is more important than anything else, let's prioritize our time that way. Sharing in Jesus' suffering is a crucial step. Be prepared to suffer for Jesus. Consider difficulties to come as solidarity with Jesus. You're saying, yeah, I'm, I'm with him. So that's, that's what's going to happen. Make participation in the resurrection of Christ your singular focus. Like Paul, you'd say that by any means possible that I might obtain Christ and his resurrection. I'm just going to end with a time of just reflecting and imagining what would happen if we really grabbed hold of this. What would happen if we really did this? Could you, could you imagine someone right now who was trying to earn God's approval? And, it, and, and in some ways, it's not their fault because that's all they ever knew. Maybe in their family of origin, they only got their dad's affection. Talk about this on Father's Day. only got dad's affection when they did right stuff. Like when I'm proud of you because you did this and that. You got good grades and you did all the right stuff. And so they kind of approached God the same way. And they're like, okay, God, I want your affection and I want your approval. So I'll just be a really good person and I'll work really hard. But they, there was never enough working really hard and there was never enough. And in, in the end, they could never get all the approval they needed. And then they heard about the gospel of grace that just said, you can't, you can't earn it. But here's the good news. You don't need to. What you can't earn is already yours in Christ. But it won't be a bill paid in the end. It will be a gracious gift given. Could you imagine someone who just finally stopped trying to earn their heavenly Father's affection and then finally received it in faith in Christ? What a day that would be. If God's brought you to a place where you're ready to say, I can't, I can't, that's a beautiful place to be. Because guess what? You're right. But the amazing power of God's word is in him. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you so you can in him. I pray that you'll go throughout whatever this week holds for you, knowing that you can't, but in him you can. May he fill you with all blessing, power, and strength to accomplish all that he calls you to do. Go in his peace.
Could you imagine a church that had been kind of going through the motions? It was kind of a right to be good enough, but then God and his word started, and they, and they started approaching God with dogged determination that they might know Christ. Could you imagine Christians who had kind of been piling up big piles of muddy manure, and, and God brought them up short so that they might know him and have fellowship with his suffering. I want you to process these things as we close our service and worship. And I want to ask that you would sing this last song as a prayer, crying out to God, saying, Lord, I need you. I need you desperately. Would you worship together with us as we cry out to God, expressing our need for him?